This video is sponsored by Tab for a Cause. Tab for Cause is a browser extension that donates to charity every time you open a new tab, all without costing you a single penny. It's all very simple. You go to tab.gladly.io slash Quinton, you install the app, and then you get right back to browsing. You can even choose which charities receive donations from your internet use. Maybe you want to help build libraries, or send emergency aid, or support the hunt for a cure to rabies. I decided to do this sponsor because it seemed like a really neat cause, and I'm hoping you guys will agree and will give it a chance. With that, let's begin. For the longest time, I had a relationship with The Office that was unlike any TV show I had ever experienced. It wasn't just true that I had watched it many times or that I remembered a lot of it. I often took solace in allowing myself to re-experience episodes every single day. I read that one of the best ways to cure depression is to be around old friends, and that a lot of people end up binging shows with personalities they enjoy because it gives them the same sorts of feelings. Anyways, a couple months ago, while I was shuttling through episodes, I discovered one I had never seen before, probably because I slept through it. And the high of emotions I felt watching it was unlike anything I had felt in years. To the extent that I now purposefully skip a few episodes of every new show that I end up binging, just to recreate that feeling. But only a few months ago, my relationship with this show changed just a tiny bit. You see, the actresses who played Pam and Angela in the show have begun doing a week-by-week -week recap podcast, asking the fanbase to watch the show alongside them. Because of this, I have been watching The Office exclusively in chronological order, one week at a time. And I think this has really helped me take a step back and appreciate what truly makes the show above and beyond all expected standards. During my latest rewatch of the first season, all I could think was, this is a show that is pretty good. It's fun to watch, the acting is good, the writers are clearly very talented, it's a good show. And yet, I kept also finding myself thinking, I never thought The Office was good. I thought it was great, I thought it was one of the greatest sitcoms of all time. When does The Office become great? And now, only a few weeks into binging season 2, I have my answer. Season 2 episode 2 is what I believe to be one of the most important episodes in the evolution of how the show was written, but more importantly, how the writers approached tackling the mechanical bull that was Michael Scott. So to understand why this episode was one of the ones that made the show great, we first have to stop and remind ourselves of what it had been up to this moment. The American Office first premiered in March 2005 and was an adaptation of the British version of the show, which had been created by Stephen Merchant and Ricky Gervais. Most people will agree that while the first season is classic within the greater context of the show, and it has episodes which solidify its destiny to eventually become one of the greatest shows of the decade, it still was missing something important that it would need for its path to greatness. And that thing was Michael Scott. Or rather, everything we would accept Michael to be after season two. In the first episode of The Office, Michael was written to be a very close copy of David Brent, the character Gervais had portrayed in the original show. His hair is greased up and slicked back to imply a great thinning. He is often personified, both in personality and appearance, as a slimy, sweaty mess. And he was, of course, written exclusively to torture everyone else on the show. Season 2 started a trend where the writers started to realize that they potentially had a chance of creating a much longer show than they had originally foreseen. And because of this, they started making the steps of expanding Michael as a character. Because while his simplistic horribleness worked for a six episode run, it probably wouldn't for a show destined to last for hundreds of episodes. It was no longer enough to just show him being bad and to then say, haha, that's bad, do you get it? They suddenly desired to ask questions, to have him evolve over time, and to bring a method to his madness. Season 2 is the first set of episodes in the show's history that didn't just say, Michael is bad, but that also dared to ask a very complex series of questions. Why is Michael bad? What led him to be bad? And can he not be bad? Can he learn to change? And can we learn to love him? The most important thing that Season 2 Episode 2 manages to do is introduce us to the one and only Todd Packard, 
Packard is the man that Michael would like to see as his best friend. He's loud, he's crude, he's cruel, and he is impossible to put up with. He also represents a lot of how Michael had come across during season one, bringing to the audience a lot of the same energy. And yet, by the time we've seen the two together for only mere moments, we understand that they are very different people. Packard carries himself with a great importance that makes him seek to make others feel inferior or uncomfortable. His actions are not accidental or born of any social disorders. He's just a massive asshole. Michael, despite often acting similar to Packard, is none of those things. At least, not on purpose. If I were to break down this leading man in as few words as possible, these are the ones I would choose. Michael Scott has never been loved. We're never cued into much about his origins, what growing up was like for him, or anything like that. The closest we ever get is in Season 2, Episode 18, Bring Your Daughter to Work Day, when he gets his hand on an old TV show he had appeared on as a child, and we see a very depressing moment. What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be married and have a hundred kids so I can have a hundred friends and no one can say no to being my friend. This is a glimpse into the childhood of a man who grew up to be broken, and the quote signals to us a deep well of Michael's insecurities and motivations. It also happens to be the plot of the show. Michael Scott was born with a massive talent as a people-pleasing paper person, and was elevated to a position of power because of this. Like many men, Michael immediately chooses to abuse his power to get him something he never had before. But it's not something sickening or evil, it's just one thing. Friendship. He wants to use his position as a boss and as a manager to force everyone below him to be friends with him. This subtle distinction in his motivations totally change how he's presented from the first run of episodes to the second. In Season 1, Episode 3, we see Michael push the responsibility of choosing a new inferior insurance plan off to Dwight. Throughout the episode, we see this is mainly because of either a fear he has of the office turning on him, or because he's just too spineless to make tough choices and to act like a boss. Having another employee take the blame is preferable to him than confrontation. In Season 2, we see a really similar storyline, but with a completely different implication behind it, that sort of retcons the events of the previous season. In the story, Michael has been tasked with choosing someone from the office to let go of in order to save money, and he has procrastinated up until Halloween, the deadline. And for one clearly stated reason. Michael wants to believe that he is friends with everyone in the office, and implicitly he doesn't have friends outside of work, so he's afraid that firing someone will make that person hate him, a concept he can't bring himself to handle. Michael needs to be loved, he needs someone to care about him, but he struggles to understand how people work, how they think. He's not a bad person to the core, He's just wired up wrong, and he surrounds himself with a lot of bad influences. So when we see Michael interact with Packard for the first time, we come to realize something. Michael respects this man, because he views him as a strong enough personality to gain the love and admiration of everyone around him. He thinks that Packard is a badass, and wants to be just like him. But what he doesn't realize is that everyone hates Packard. He's the least popular person in the world, but everyone pretends to not be bothered by him because they know that fighting him will only make him more obnoxious. But Michael sees him as the coolest guy ever and wants to do anything to be loved by him, even if that means putting up with and enabling constant abuse. It's clearly not just that he's too spineless to stand up for himself, but that he also thinks that Packard likes him, and he believes that the cruelty involved in their relationship is just part of that exchange. We see this a lot in the show. Michael's desire to be loved and to unconditionally love in return ends with him in multiple emotionally abusive relationships. Specifically, the one that he forms with Jan Levinson, a person who takes advantage of his subservient attitude and willingness to do anything to find validation. The Dinner Party episode is the most important in the show not only because it's the funniest, but because it's Michael trying desperately to live out a fantasy. Of being someone with a loving housewife and with friends who care about him enough to want to come over. The entire summation of his relationship with Jan 
is that it's never really love, but that he's too afraid of being alone to accept this and let it end. I've heard a lot of people say things like, if The Office was made today, it would have been cancelled by PC culture policing what jokes can and cannot be told. Like before in my video about It's Always Sunny, I find myself very confused by this sentiment. Because in this case, the show is being written by leftist PC writers who are trying to make fun of edgy, hack comedians. If you think the humor in Michael screaming racial slurs in the middle of the day is that he's actually doing something funny, and if you think that acting like this actually is amusing outside of fiction, never talk to me. Season 2 is brilliant partially in its ability to solidify the point the show is trying to make about moments like these. In Season 2, Episode 1, The Dundies, we see Michael begin performing as a character named Ping. Michael playing Ping is not funny in the slightest. What's funny is when the camera pans over, and we see an Asian woman at the Chili's just staring at this horrible, horrible man. In narrative, the joke is framed at her expense. But because of her inclusion in the meta-narrative, the meta-joke is redirected towards mocking Michael instead. This subtle distinction in how the bit is presented shows us a wide nuance in the purpose of comedy like this being presented in the show. This brings us back to Season 2, Episode 2, which, tangents aside, is what this video is supposed to be about. The main story of this episode revolves around another person at Dunder Mifflin losing their position at the company due to sexual misconduct. And Michael is informed that Toby has been asked to give a presentation on appropriate behavior and the company's policy on harassment. Michael's first reaction is that this is going to mean that he can't make jokes around the office, or send inappropriate email chains to other people in the workplace, and he believes this is going to be a battle to preserve an important thing to the lives of everyone in the building. Toby then adds that corporate is going to be sending a lawyer to speak to him about this, and this causes Michael to further spiral into his ultimate conclusion at this point. He is seen as the problem, his free speech is going to be affected, and thus, he is the victim in this situation. This next scene is short, but it's essential to piecing together the writer's ultimate thesis about who Michael is and why he's like this. In the scene, Michael goes down to outside the warehouse and attempts to find a brand new, hilarious, raunchy, edgy joke that he can use to disrupt Toby's seminar to show that by following these anti-harassment policies, they're losing the best part of the workplace. The warehouse workers, when asked to give him funny material that isn't strictly appropriate, begin mocking him, something which he clearly can't handle. A joke, but not necessarily at my expense. This is the quintessential Michael scene in terms of defining the joke about the edginess he brings to the screen. Michael claims that his comedy exists outside of impact, implying that people criticizing him just can't handle his material. But when the same level of humor is directed at him, he can't handle it, seems visually uncomfortable, and runs away to avoid the situation. It's also really important that while Michael searches for the golden humor that they all face losing if they start having an appropriate workplace, he never discovers it. The closest he comes is a joke he tells about a prostitute who gives her clients crabs, which is at best sort of a lame pun. When he finally crashes Toby's presentation, the best he has to deliver is a sex doll he drags into the room. Which I love the implication that he just has had this in his car and probably spent the last 10 minutes blowing it up. He then proceeds to struggle to find any figurative situation where the company's policy could be limiting, continually making statements which go beyond inappropriate, ending with him asking Pam to make out with the sex doll to illustrate a potential situation where she is a lesbian. While Toby forces Michael to do more training in private by watching a PR video, Dwight approaches Toby to ask for personal help. You said that we could come to you if we had any questions. Sure. Where's the clitoris? This is the greatest scene in all of The Office. When a lawyer and the higher-ups from corporate finally arrive, they're horrified to see him in the middle of an outrageously offensive moment. And they try to simply explain to Michael that he is in a managerial position, and that he has a responsibility to be... responsible. The group go back and forth in numerous moments fighting over this topic until a new person enters the scene, who Michael introduces as his lawyer. If corporate wants to take him to court, he's prepared to fight. 
Jan then responds with the greatest revelation of the episode. Michael, Mr. O'Malley is your lawyer. We have him on retainer to protect the company as well as upper level management such as yourself. Michael is not being persecuted. He's not being threatened by higher ups. He's not in any real danger. Corporate is just trying to protect him, even if it means putting his interests ahead of all of the people under him. He can never be the victim, because the system is constructed to protect him. This moment causes Michael to clearly reconsider how he's been acting. This is both because of the stated reason of him being proud of his status, and the unspoken reason that he probably starts to understand the same conclusion that the audience has come to by this point. He isn't the victim. And if he's not the victim, then who is? The final scene of the episode follows Michael listening to Packard tell some outrageous jokes which go unchecked, and for the first time in the whole show, he seems like a real boss. All the way down to just his posture. And when Packard goes too far, making a sexual joke about an ugly woman and referring to Phyllis by name, he suddenly shuts Packard down. No, 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 that crosses the line. Excuse me? Michael then backtracks, blaming Kevin and choosing not to punish Packard in any way. He then attempts to comfort Phyllis by telling her that she is attractive, which while meant with good motivations goes way too far in the typical Michael way. This episode doesn't show Michael get better or learn his lesson, far from it, but it does do something more important. It shows the audience that those things happening are not impossible, and that this character is not immovable. Part of the great fun of watching The Office is starting to see those shining moments where Michael becomes a better person, even if they're sandwiched in between less than stellar scenes. Michael's journey in the show is simply trying to recover from his blatant lack of all self-awareness, and the secret to his journey is really two things. Him accepting that he is not the center of the universe, and him attempting to understand how his actions hurt others even when his motivations are good. As the show goes on, he meets people who want validation from him, just as he does from them. And this is what helps him create a great bond with so many of his co-workers. The most important of these is introduced after Toby announces that he's going to be leaving the branch, leading Michael to both celebrate and prepare to torture his replacement. But much to his shock, he actually gets along very well with Holly, to the point of romance. People often complain that Holly is written to just be a mirror of his personality, but simplifying their eventual relationship that far is missing the point. What's incredible about their storyline is that despite reminding us of Michael, Holly is high-functioning. She understands the feelings of people around her. When she makes people uncomfortable, it's not her fault, and she usually understands what she's done. And she goes through the day without being an edgy hack. She reminds us of Michael without reminding us of Packard. And Holly is also a person that Michael understands, and because of that, when he sees her in pain and understands that it's his fault, he wants to change how he acts as a person. I'm sorry. It is good. No, no, it's not. Eat the gold. It's not. One day. Threat Level Midnight is probably the most important story in his arc, not only because it's an absolute classic, but because it's the first time in the show where Michael finally forces himself to look at his own image of how he sees the world, and to start laughing. It's when he first realizes that he's the joke. This is directly followed by a titular episode about Todd Packard, which essentially sees Holly and Packard be forced into the same workplace. When Holly begins to realize that Packard isn't a good person, that he's a jerk and is impossible to put up with, she doesn't hesitate in telling Michael about just how inappropriate he is, not only as his girlfriend, but as his HR representative. Jim and Dwight manage to convince Packard over the phone that he's been given a cushy corporate job in Florida that he needs to fly down to take, and Michael finds out about this and decides to tell Packard the truth. But Packard, in a goodbye speech to Michael, disrespects Holly. And in return, Michael decides to let him leave without learning the truth. In a moment so small, yet so important to his arc, Michael disowns everything that Packard represents. I'm sorry about your friend. No. He's an ass. By this point, with some flaws to the side, Michael has finished his transformation from abusive boss to wholesome father figure, something he desperately wanted from the very beginning of the show. 
And when you leap around as much as I have up until recently, you miss how incredible that transformation is. His first episode features him making one of his workers cry because of his cruelty, and his last features characters crying because they can't believe that he's leaving. And this transition is all made possible by these opening episodes of Season 2, which somehow convince us of something that should be a paradox. Michael is in the wrong. He is a parody of bad people, bad comedians, bad bosses. And yet he is also someone who you are supposed to see yourself understanding. He is your protagonist, whether you like it or not. The Office is about learning to change how you act without letting go of the core of who you are as a person. It's about getting a little better each day, and allowing the people around you to guide you on that path. But most importantly, it's about finding love, finding validation, and finding friendship. But doing so in a healthy way, both for you and the people in your life. Hey guys, welcome to the Patreon Outro Crawl. Earlier this month, I briefly talked to you guys about how hectic my month has turned out to be, and overwhelmingly, you guys ended up giving me your support. Specifically, by donating to my Patreon. So we ended up surpassing numerous goals on Patreon, including one that means that I am now going to start making Patreon-exclusive content. I'm really excited to get this first video out. It's sort of a moving vlog mixed with a Q&A. I think it's pretty fun. It's going to set a good standard for the sorts of things I want to do with this kind of content from here out. So starting from here, my Patreon tiers are now $1 if you want to see early releases and these exclusive videos, $5 if you want to be in the credits, and $10 if you want to ask me a question for the monthly exclusive Q&A video. If you want to support me in any other way, you could follow me on Twitter, or just hit that subscribe button when it pops up on the screen. I'm trying to hit 400,000 subscribers by the end of 2020, and uh, just pressing that button really helps me start to make that approach. Other than all that, uh, if you guys could remember to check out Tab for Cause, also in the description, a great service. Very great guys, I was happy to have them on for this video. With that, I've been quitting Reviews, and that's all you need.